1930, the mountain climber George Mallory was asked why he wanted to climb Mount Everest. You may recall his famous answer, because it is there, he said, because it is there. It wasn't until 1953 that Everest was finally scaled, and then not by Mallory, but by Sir Edmund Hillary, who was celebrated in the press as having conquered the mountain. The native people of the Himalayas know better than to speak of conquering any mountain. Instead, they speak of befriending the mountain. This suggests a much richer relationship, one of ongoing intimacy and respect, even love. In his book entitled On Top of the World, the Italian mountain climber uh, Fosco Mariani expressed the distinctive, almost mystical lure of mountaineering. Clearly, he says, it is not only a question of an adventure, but a question of love. We are dealing with a sort of magnetic, irresistible attraction emanating from the mountains themselves. I'll certainly never forget the first time I climbed a mountain. When I was a freshman at Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, I was invited by some friends in the outing club to climb Mount Bigelow, the second tallest mountain in the state. It was going to be a working expedition. In exchange for our food and camping equipment, we would spend some of our time clearing brush from the overgrown trails on the mountainside. And that seemed like a fair trade to me. I'd done plenty of wilderness canoe camping uh, back home in Minnesota, but I'd never climbed a real mountain. So I said, yes. We left campus on a crisp autumn Friday after classes were done and drove north past blazing foliage and countless roadside cider stands until we arrived late in the afternoon at the base of the mountain. And then we began to climb. As, it, as we climbed, it got darker and darker and steeper and steeper and steeper until finally we were scrambling hand over hand, struggling to keep up with our leader whose flashlight beacon we could see uh, dancing on the face of the boulders in the darkness ahead of us and above us. At last, we arrived exhausted at the camp of lean-tos built by the Appalachian Mountain Club. We devoured a quick supper and collapsed into sleep. The next morning, I awoke to one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. The pine trees around our campsite were all dwarfed by the altitude and the severe weather. None of them reached much higher than my knees. I felt like a giant. And these trees were completely covered with a crust of frost about an inch thick, which gave them an unearthly appearance. And below us, a thousand feet or more below us, the forest was brilliant in its autumn colors, while to the north, the wide expanse of Flagstaff Lake perfectly mirrored the bright blue sky. I knew then that I was having what the psychologist Abraham Maslow calls a peak experience, a moment of natural transcendence, which he considered to be the source and inspiration of all religious values. Peak experiences are those moments of extraordinary insight when all the pieces of our lives come together momentarily into a coherent pattern, a pattern which gives our existence meaning, perspective, and ultimate orientation. In the words of our opening hymn, the soul has lifted moments above the drift of days when life's great meaning breaketh in sunrise on our ways. When I came down from Bigelow Mountain and returned to my studies, the experience, the image, the symbol of the mountain remained with me as I faced other challenges, both academic and personal. One of those metaphorical mountains began as an academic challenge, but evolved over time into something more personal. And I'm speaking here, of course, about my relation to this mountain of literature, which is called the Bible. I began studying the Bible quite simply because it was there. It was there as a requirement for my religion degree, for one thing, but it was also there as an objective reality in the world around me and as a real, though mostly un unconscious, presence within my own psyche, my own soul. The Bible was and is an inescapable fact of our history. It looms large and casts a shadow over our lives 
whether we want it to or not. In his magnificent book, The Great Code, the Bible and Literature, the Canadian literary critic Northrop Fry asks the rhetorical question, why does this huge, sprawling, tactless book sit there inscrutably in the middle of our cultural heritage, frustrating all our attempts to walk around it? Now, we Unitarian Universalists often do try to walk around it, to avoid it or simply ignore it. We're afraid, and rightly so, of the ways in which the Bible has been used and continues to be used as an instrument of domination and oppression. But I think it's a mistake to abandon the book altogether, as Unitarians have often done. For one thing, this abdication leaves the field wide open to the passionate intensity of the fundamentalists whose interpretation then becomes seen as the only possible way of reading scripture. The late Episcopal Bishop John Spong once wrote a book entitled Rescuing the Bible from the Fundamentalists. And I think that remains the challenge facing liberal religious people today. It's important, I think, during this month when our Soul Matters theme is heritage, to note that much of the trailblazing work in the field of biblical studies in this country was done by Unitarians and Universalists. I won't recite the names, they won't be familiar with you, to you, but their important work was, has been done, and it's part of our heritage that we've neglected or forgotten or repressed. We've, in my view, sold our birthright for a mess of pottage, to use a biblical phrase. A second reason for not uh, uh, abandoning the Bible is that if we do so, we deprive ourselves and our children of a rich cultural treasure. I think of an incident related by Brian and Diane Belanger, members of the Cedar Lane Unitarian Church in Bethesda, Maryland. It's a sad and poignant story about leading a group of teenagers from their congregation on a tour of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. These bright, privileged adolescents students at some of the finest public schools in the country and participants in the religious education program at one of our largest and most affluent congregations drew a complete collective blank when faced with works of art depicting biblical scenes such as David and Goliath, Samson and Delilah, or the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. I think we have some images to show there. Yeah, David and Goliath. And the next. The day may come, the Dutch-born Unitarian uh, Universalist minister Peter Fleck wrote, when people might look at Van Eyck's adoration of the lamb, that's the next one, and wonder whether it was meant to be an advertisement for a medieval brand of cattle feed. <laughs> so I think that we ought to reclaim the Bible, even if for no better reason at first, than the fact that it is there, and that by studying it, we begin to acquire and develop a basic religious and cultural literacy. The great British anthropologist Gregory Bateson liked to tell the story about growing up in an atheist household that nevertheless read the, a Bible passage every night at the dinner table. When the young Bateson questioned his father about this practice, asking, aren't we atheists? His father responded, yes, we're atheists, but we're not empty-headed atheists. At any rate, I first came at this mountain of literature with the attitude of a conqueror, like a Mallory or a Hillary. Uh, through college and graduate school, I equipped myself with the intellectual tools that I thought would enable me to make my conquest of the text. Harvard Divinity School was like the L.L. Bean of the spirit, where I was outfitted with the necessary intellectual equipment for an expedition into this forbidding territory. I learned Hebrew and Greek and the various 
forms of literary and historical criticism, which I hope would allow me to master the material in a detached academic and objective way. It's, it's over there, I'm here, it's over there. And I understand it. Now I steep, still deeply value this analytical and critical approach to the text. We religious liberals anyway, cannot go back behind the intellectual achievements uh, of historical criticism to some pre-critical innocence. We know too much to pretend that. So using these intellectual tools, the historical critical method, to clear away the theological underbrush is important and necessary work, but it's not enough. Like clearing trails on the side of Mount Big Bigelow, this critical labor is a means to an end. And the end is to arrive at that vision from the peak. Trying to conquer the text with the intellect alone does not allow for other dimensions of truth and meaning to, atur uh, to occur. In 1975, the New Testament scholar Walter Wink, and uh, we, I know you, you've worked with him, John, um, declared the historical critical method bankrupt. And by that, he didn't mean that it, it has run out of things to say or things to study. He just meant that it, it's bankrupt because it was no longer capable of achieving its purpose, which was to interpret the scriptures in a way that the past comes alive and illumines our present with new possibilities for personal and social transformation. If you look at it strictly through the lens of that historical critical method, that does not, he would say, it cannot occur. We need a, a wider lens. We need other ways of approaching the text. Every jot and tittle of this book, of this text, has been analyzed, crushed, pulverized, reduced to its basic mineral constituents, but something is still missing. As Jesus put it, when your child asks for bread, you don't give her a stone instead. So for me, that purely academic approach was not nourishing enough. I looked for more. And gradually, through a process that still remains mysterious to me, as all intimate relationships do, this mountain began to exert its irresistible magnetic influence on me. I began to see this literature not as some supposedly supernatural revelation, which either had to conquer me or be conquered by me, which was my preference, but rather I saw it as a collection of very human stories, stories with which my own story found a remarkable resonance. As I explored these narratives, I found my own self reflected back to me, amplified like an echo off the mountainside. My soul's horizons widened, and I found myself not so much looking at the Bible as some object out there. Instead, I began seeing the world from a perspective that was informed and in some sense transformed by the stories and symbols I found within these pages. I recognized that I was dealing with what the theologian David Tracy calls a classic, a classic text, whether secular or religious, carries what he calls a surplus of meaning, which resists any definitive interpretation and gives it a certain perennial and inexhaustible quality. That inexhaustible quality is what characterizes a classic piece of literature. You can't get to the bottom of it. But that's, that's not a defect. That's, that's part, that's what, that unfolding of that potential is what makes it a classic. The French philosopher Paul Ricoeur speaks of attaining what he calls a second naivete, the recovery after that critical intellectual inquiry, the recovery of a kind of innocence of vision that uh, loops back to a renewed appreciation of the material in its original integrity. Beyond the desert of criticism, he said, we wish to be called again. So without ever losing the ability to examine the Bible from that hard-won perspective of literary, critic literary historical criticism, 
I gradually began to recover the ability to appreciate with fresh eyes and ears the voice and vision of the text. As with the Zen saying, first there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is. First there is a Bible, then there is no Bible, because it's been deconstructed into its constituent parts. It's been analyzed into its uh, tiniest uh, pieces. There is no Bible anymore. But with that recovery of the second naivete, it's possible to see it again in its original integrity. The great Unitarian preacher A. Powell Davies was the minister at All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. in the 1950s, a, a beacon of sanity and wisdom in the midst of the McCarthy era. He was once challenged by a fundamentalist minister who said, you Unitarians don't believe in the Bible. And Davies thought about it for a moment and then replied, you're right. I don't believe in the Bible, but I love the Bible. And I think that's more important. Over the years, I too have learned to love the Bible, to befriend it, and to live with it. Now, please don't misunderstand me here. When I speak of befriending the Bible, I'm not saying that I like or endorse everything I find there. Far from it. Many of its stories are terrible and violent, of course. But that too is part of the human condition, and we ignore it at our peril. The poet Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote, the mind has mountains, cliffs of fall, frightful, sheer, no man fathomed. When we find these abysmal cliffs of fall mirrored in the text, we may come to see ourselves in a new way within an enlarged horizon and in light of an overarching redemptive story. And so we may begin to live differently. The Bible is not a straightforward model for morality. It is rather an ancient and radically honest mirror of human identity in all its depth and difficulty, in all its beauty and terror. The feminist biblical scholar Phyllis Tribble puts it this way, if art imitates life, scripture likewise reflects it in both holiness and horror. Reflections themselves, so this image of a mirror, it's a mirror of identity. So uh, reflections themselves, she goes on, neither mandate nor manufacture change, yet by enabling insight, they may inspire transformation. Uh, this is obviously a different approach than one which sees in the Bible a collection of dogmatic authoritative answers to moral and ethical questions. As I see it, the Bible is not so much a book of moral answers as it is a text which continually poses radical existential questions to us, starting with God's first question to humankind posed in the garden. Anyone know what that question was? First question addressed to human beings by God? Where are you? You can take that. As deep as you can take that in any way you want. Where are you? Where are we? In any case, our ethical stance cannot simply be read off the text like a transcript. We are always faced with the difficult work of moral discernment. And in that work, we must include and use many extra biblical sources, including secular perspectives and insights from other world religions. This Bible, of course, is not the only mountain. It's not the only sacred scripture. There are other classic texts, other vistas and lookouts on life, each providing its unique insight. Some of the most powerful and transformative insights I have experienced, for example, have come through reading sacred texts in uh, interfaith settings, reading the story of the stories of Joseph in Pharaoh's court, for example, together with Jews and Muslims, and sharing perspectives on the con on a text held in common, or story held in common. As Unitarian Universalists, we are invited to draw upon many sources for spiritual inspiration and authority. And I honor that commitment to pluralism, and I encourage you to do so as well. The image that comes to mind for me is not of some single summit toward which we are all ascending, but rather a kind of Appalachian trail of the spirit, if you will, 
with many different peaks and prospects, with range upon range of texts and traditions. From peak to peak, it flashes, we sang earlier. Just as mountains are formed by the clash of great geological forces, so too this Bible came together as a result of powerful historical forces, working over a thousand years and more, conflicting and sometimes converging, converging, creating and destroying, ordered and chaotic. In the description of this sermon that I wrote for the newsletter, I asked the question, can the Bible be redeemed for use by contemporary universalists? This was, in fact, the question that motivated my research project for my Doctor of Ministry degree, the dynamic and energy of a group of Unitarian Universalists discussing and arguing and wrestling with this text is, in my experience, the best way to study it. I convened a group of Unitarian Universalists to spend a year together meeting weekly to wrestle with these texts, and I wrote it up for my uh, dissertation. Uh, and learned a lot and, and came up with the answer, yes, it can be redeemed. It, is a, it can be a useful source or resource. And as I say, it really meant to be used in a group. That's not to say you shouldn't read it alone, but the practice of purely private Bible study is a very recent development. I remember a New Yorker cartoon from a few years ago that showed two men at a, top, a cocktail party, typical New Yorker cartoon, one holding a martini and the other wearing a clerical collar, probably an Episcopal priest, trying to make conversation. The man with a martini says, I really enjoyed the Bible. As if it were some kind of book you read in your recliner, like the latest best-selling novel. It's not that kind of thing. And it, it, so it's, it's something to be wrestled with in, in a group. Um, and it helps to have a guide. If it hadn't been for Professor Sam Butcher and his flashlight, I'd still be lost somewhere on Mount Bigelow. And likewise, with this literature, it's good to have someone who's walked the pathways and knows a little bit about the territory. And although I'm not a biblical scholar, I've traveled the paths up and down the mountainside enough that I, that I can serve as that kind of guide, and I love sharing what I've learned on the journey. So whether you've been reading the Bible in secret on your own, or you've never cracked the spine of the good book, you might want to meet tomorrow, come tomorrow evening, 6.30 in the boardroom, conference room, we'll do some mountain climbing. Of course, we can't remain on the mountaintop. It's a nice place to visit. Well, it's not always nice, but it's a good place to visit, a necessary place to visit. But we can't stay there. Our real life, our life with others, is lived in the lowlands and in the pastures and the valleys and the coolies. This is the real promised land, the land of our life together, wherever we dwell, in all our messy humanity. Each of us glimpses this promised land through our given lens and from our particular vantage point, our particular peak and perspective. It's only when we come down from the mountain, down from those high places to the common ground, the meeting place, that we realize the fullness of spiritual life, the fullness of our human life together. The mount for vision, but below, the paths of daily duty go. And nobler life therein shall own the pattern on the mountain shown.